Hi, you're listening to It Happened to Me, a rare disease and medical challenges podcast. The mission of our podcast is to support you, our listeners, and to create community as you confront the toughest challenges in life. All of us will experience health hardships. The real question is how we adapt. That's the focus of It Happened to Me, which wants to help you overcome limitations and live a full and satisfying life. Drawing on their own health challenges, co-hosts Kathy Gildenhorn and Beth Glassman interview guests who share stories and research to help you succeed in the face of difficult health obstacles. It happened to me, I'm not alone, and neither are you. Matt Goldstein is a physician, scientist, and entrepreneur. He founded companies, built R&D teams, and led strategy and execution of both preclinical research and clinical development. Matt was a partner at Related Sciences, a venture creation firm. As an entrepreneur at Third Rock Ventures, he spent a decade building and operating Third Rock portfolio companies. He was responsible for building and leading the immunology program at Tango Therapeutics, the centerpiece of Tango's strategic multi-billion dollar partnership with Gilead Sciences. He also served as development head for Tango LEAD programs, which entered the clinic in first half of 2022. Matt was a co-founder of Neon Therapeutics. He led translational medicine and early development through completion of their clinical study and initial public offering. He's a graduate of Swarthmore College and the MD PhD program at Stanford University, where he pioneered novel cancer immunotherapies in the lab of Ron Levy, MD. He completed his clinical training in internal medicine at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He lives in Boston with his wife, Myra, their second daughter, Kaya, and son, Ezra. His oldest daughter, Javi, died on January 20th, 2021 of Tay-Sachs disease. Matthew, we are deeply sorry for the loss of your daughter, Javi. Today, we want to honor her memory by educating others about Tay-Sachs. For those that don't know about Tay-Sachs, can you explain what the disease is and how it affects individuals who have it? Uh, uh, Sure, and and first, Kathy and Beth, thanks so much for having me. Um, It's an honor to be on the show with you guys and um, it's a, a great pleasure to be able to talk about Hav and share her story and share our story. And hopefully it serves as uh, an inspiration to others to think about preventive genetic screening um, when when they're thinking about becoming future parents and, and obviously in a whole variety of other areas. Um, so Tay-Sachs, uh, Tay-Sachs is um, sort of one of the hallmark recessive genetic diseases. Um, You you almost in in some ways as a a young Jewish person learn about it in Hebrew school to some extent. And in high school biology, uh, early medical school, it is one of the classic case studies that people use to describe recessive genetic diseases or, or inherited diseases. Um, In order to develop Tay-Sachs disease, a child needs to inherit uh, a a, a mutated DNA from both the mother and the father. Um, They need two copies of this mutated DNA sequence in order to develop the disease. And that mutated uh, DNA sequence ultimately results in a protein in the case of Tay-Sachs, it's a protein called hex A. um, And that protein ends up not functioning very well um, and not functioning in the way that it should when the DNA that encodes that protein is mutated. 
Um, and what that protein normally does inside the cells of the central nervous system is to function as a somewhat of a, a sort of recycling uh, or, or sort of garbage uh, dump type of process. And over time, cells will recycle and, and reuse components um, as they grow and divide. And, um, and hexA is one of the proteins or enzymes that accomplishes that recycling. And when it's broken or malfunctioning due to DNA mutations that encode that protein, uh, you get a buildup of um, what, what is called uh, GM2 gangliocide. It's a, it's a lipid or, or a, a fatty molecule that ends up building up in cells of the central nervous system. And eventually those cells get so full of that um, of that lipid that they are no longer able to function and they die. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, as cells of the central nervous system stop functioning and start dying, that functions controlled by our nervous system um, start to be impaired. Mm. And so children, um, there, there's a whole range of Tay-Sachs disease, a, a variety of different flavors in terms of when it first shows up. Um, in the case of our daughter, Javi, she had infantile Tay-Sachs. So um, in that case, a child who is born um, with Tay-Sachs will have some normal development or, or will appear somewhat normal for a period of time, but then will start to lose functions. They'll lose motor functions, um, eventually the ability to move their arms and legs, to feed themselves, um, to be able to pull up or stand up even, uh, which is very rare in this population. Um, uh, loss of vision, loss of hearing, um, and eventually loss of ability to eat um, or or, uh, or speak. Um, and as, uh, as many of the organ systems lose their ability to function, um, uh, infantile Tay-Sachs and, and Tay-Sachs in all of its flavors will event eventually result in, in death. Um, and the average age um, for uh, kids with infantile Tay-Sachs um, is, is between two and four years old at, mm -hmm. at the time of death. So it's a, um, uh, you know, particularly horrible form uh, of this disease. And um, one of the reasons why it's, uh, it, it's been studied for so long, and um, fortunately that we've made great progress in preventing it, um, unfortunately not in our case, obviously. Matt, I just wanted to say how terribly sorry I am. And I can imagine not only as a father, but then as a doctor to understand what your daughter was going through and to know her, what her prognosis was going to be had to have been almost ignorance would have been better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to know what she was going to suffer with uh, must have been excruciating. My heart just breaks to hear this story. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to share to share your story with us. And, and hopefully we can talk about uh, screening and preconception screening and we can, and through you, we can get the word out that your sadness doesn't have to be everyone's sadness, that we can do something about this together. Um, so in, in furthering that goal, can you talk a little bit about the pre-screening, uh, preconception uh, screening that you and your wife uh, went through before a hobby? Yeah, so most Ashkenazi Jews, fortunately, are aware of, of carrier screening. And uh, as I said earlier, it is something that it feels like you're taught in Hebrew school. <laughs> and yes. we undertook preconception carrier screening. So when we were thinking about getting pregnant, uh, my wife went to her OBGYN to get tested. Um, he ordered a panel of diseases that are more common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And my wife found out that she was a carrier for Tay-Sachs and another disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, 
when she got those results, the OBGYN instructed me to go get tested. And uh, so I, I did. I went to my physician um, with those results and, and uh, asked to be tested as well. Obviously, the concern is for both parents carrying, uh, being carriers for the same disease. And um, unfortunately, that physician ended up ordering the wrong test for oh, no. defect oh. disease oh. and um, reported me as not a carrier, um, which oh. my wife and I were obviously so excited about and um, went ahead and conceived naturally. Uh, and Javi was born on our wedding anniversary, September 4th, 2018. Um, oh. And we had oh. no idea uh, until the, the day of her diagnosis, obviously. Oh, this is a heartbreaker. I, yes. I am so sorry. You know, the human element, I guess we we learn so much, but uh, we're all human and uh, we make mistakes. And oh, what a tragic story. I am so very sorry. So when Javi was born, you didn't notice anything, I would assume. No, she was beautiful and strong. Aww. Um, when she came out and they put her on my wife's chest, she lifted up her neck and turned wow. her head side to side. And the nurses said, oh, my gosh, she is so strong. What an Aww. incredible baby. And it was like that for months. We were first time parents, so we didn't really know what to expect. What to expect. Um, yeah. And I think had we had a, an older child, maybe would have seen some of the signs of tay -Sachs earlier on, but we really didn't appreciate that anything was going on almost until maybe 11 or 12 months, maybe in hindsight, somewhat before that. And, and when you say something was going on, were there signs of regression? What, what was it? No, she, she was just developing slowly. Slowly. Uh -huh. Missing wife, those markers when she went for well visits. Yeah, some somewhat. My wife just described it as that she looked like she was moving through quicksand, that mm. things were a little bit slower or mm. uh, less vigorous than than you would have necessarily anticipated. But, you know, we saw it as as like Hob being sort of elegant and oh. smooth. Oh. And she had such a captivating personality the way she looked at you and her smile, her laugh were, were so captivating that many of the physicians we saw, even after she was diagnosed with developmental delay, said, she's going to be fine. She's so beautiful. She's so strong. She's so poised. She's going to be fine. And it wasn't until 15 months after we had taken a lot of steps to put her through early intervention and physical therapy uh, and seen a number of physicians, she wasn't making any progress. And that oh. started to be more of a, a hallmark. That something, and something so up. then take us on your diagnostic journey. At what point did you know you needed more testing and, and find out about the Tay-Sachs? Yeah, so at her 12-month appointment, we saw her pediatrician, and uh, she said to us, you know, she's doing great. There's a few things that she seems to be a little slow on, and I, uh, a lot, this happens with a lot of children, and we have these amazing programs called Early Intervention that help kids get up to speed, and, and I'll refer you to those, and I will also suggest that you see a few specialists in neurology, orthopedics, mm. developmental pediatrics, um, just to have a more seasoned expert set of eyes take a look at her and, and confirm that there's nothing else going on. And so we went and saw neurology and orthopedics and developmental peds, and everyone said she's going to be fine. And um, it wasn't until that, that was, um, so that was, Hav was born in September. Uh, you know, we started on that journey, September, October. It wasn't until after Thanksgiving in November that we saw, uh, another developmental pediatrician who gave us the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. 
Oh, um, wow. Which, which was devastating. Uh-huh. Uh, we got back in the car and uh, my wife and I had taken separate cars to the appointment because we thought we were going to be going back to work. And um, I mean, mm. I, I got back in the car after that and just sobbed. Um, yeah, of course. And of course. It was devastating. She said to us, you know, Javi has a uncharacteristic history for this, but more and more we're understanding that there are genetic causes. So I'd like you to see this neurogeneticist at Boston Children's. And two uh-huh. weeks later, we saw him. He started um, uh, uh, that visit with a very thorough exam of Hav. And um, he sat her down on the floor and I unzipped my jacket. And when I did that, she startled. And it was something we had been seeing that she would seem to jump or startle in response to noises Noise. that you wouldn't expect. And it turns out that's a hallmark of Tay-Sachs. Oh, uh, wow. he, he asked us at that moment whether we had been tested for Tay-Sachs. And we laughed at him because we obviously had, had. and said, you know, of all the things it could be, it's not Tay-Sachs. And um, he went ahead and ordered a bunch of tests, including a, a test for Tay-Sachs. And uh, 24 hours later, we we got the result that um, it, in fact, was Tay-Sachs disease. Wow. And how did you and Myra cope with the shock and the emotional impact of, of the diagnosis, especially when you thought you had been tested and cleared for Tay-Sachs? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's such a hard time, you know, like I... Um, I remember I came home from the hospital. I I had gone to the hospital to pick up a blood test from this physician. And um, we had gotten in uh, and he called me into his office. He said, can can you come back to my house? And I knew at that point that something was wrong. And he sat me down and he said, he took me through some results and he said, I'm so sorry, Hav has Tay-Sachs disease. And I don't remember much about what happened after that, but somehow I got back down to the parking lot and into the car and I got home and came into the house and Myra was on the phone um, in our bedroom and I walked in and as soon as she saw my face, she hung up the phone and um, I, I told her what I had heard from Dr. Sid and she screamed and she said our you know our daughter is going to die and it was devastating Uh, uh, she was 11 weeks pregnant with our second child the next day we were in high risk ob and she had a chorionic villus sampling which is like an amniocentesis Mm -hmm. um, to test the fetus, um, who is now Kaya, our three-year-old, um, to test to test the fetus to see whether she was also affected with Tay-Sachs. And fortunately, she's not. She's a carrier. Um, she has my mutation, but that was a, a pretty Just intense- a miracle. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. Yeah. And then yeah. tell us about Harvey. What foods did she like? What are some of the favorite activities you do together? Yeah. Hav was amazing. She was so beautiful, had the most incredible eyes and Mm. smile. Um, And, you know, we would take her out on the plane to places to, to, you know, restaurants and people would stop and say, she is so gorgeous. What an unbelievably beautiful child. Um, And obviously I'm biased, but you know, she, she was just the, the most stunning um, you know, one of the amazing things is that the only thing she ever really crawled for, and, and she only ever crawled just a few, a few feet, um, was, was Hala. We, <laughs> we have so this, for, um, for our listeners, we will tell you Hala yeah. is bread. It's, it's yeah. something that is, uh, eaten, uh, 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 on holidays, but 
not always. We have it's, it it's every really week an on egg Friday. Bread. Yeah, it's an egg yeah, bread it's that's delicious and bread yummy, and it's <laughs> soft and it's delicious. Yeah, and we have a really fantastic bakery here in Boston called Rosenfelds that makes everybody thinks their own bakery is the best. How it's the best. Yes. This yes. is the yes. best all around, and <laughs> okay. And so that was one of her favorite things. And uh, uh, as a result of that, you know, we, that was part of this whole story of how we learned to live with her in a particularly profound way during her life. Um, and that was this decision to celebrate her every week, to celebrate a birthday every week. And we did that on Shabbat. And sh so Shabbat became Shabbirthdays. Aww. celebrated her every week every Friday um, sometimes alone but a lot of times with friends and family and lots of food and lots of wine and long dinners and she just loved that she loved being at the table and you know being held she was basically passed from arms to arms um, uh, you know the entire time and yeah, she just, the, the presence of family and love and tears and laughter was, was so much, um, so much of her. It was really so much of who she was and what she brought out. That was Hafi, um still um, alive when Kaya was born? Yeah, so Kaya and Hav overlapped six months oh. Um which which is such a gift, obviously, and and to be able to have photos of them together is such an incredible. I, yeah, thing. Wow! Um, and did she love being a big sister? Oh, amazing! You know, just some of the moments. Even she was losing a lot at that point, obviously. Um, but you just see the way gestures that she would make towards Kai. Um, you know, the way she would turn her head when she'd hear her voice, um, the way she was like calm in her presence. Kai is like got this just over the top energy and excitement and um, and Hav always sort of got this sense of calm when when she was around Kai. It was it was an incredibly beautiful thing. Oh, what a wonderful tribute. I, I have to say it's just beautiful listening. We We all have a a feeling about your blessed daughter. I, I, you really have done Absolutely. her great justice. I, I really am very taken with what you're saying. And, you know, you described the appointment with the doctor when you were told the prognosis of your daughter. So I wonder what you think about genetic counseling and how that sort of conversation would be so radically different mm -hmm. um, for families thinking about um, having a family and how they uh, are going to navigate if they they do, uh, if screening comes up, that there may be an issue and how they make these decisions for their family. It's a very good question, Beth, and a really important one. And I think reflects the reflects the challenges with our medical system that our yes. experience underscores and, and and challenges that people face every day and 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 that are not um a surprise or unknown at, at all our our medical system is is a disease care system it's not a health care system and well put, yeah. And we don't do a good job at preventive care. And I think as I dug into what happened with Hav and what happened to us, what I came to really appreciate, which I knew in some ways from my own medical training and, and awareness of the, the field and the state of things, but we have in preventive genetic screening tools and capability that are very, very good. They are robust. They are high quality. They are well validated. Those tools can allow us to prevent people from dying. Those tools can allow us to prevent 
children from being born with rare diseases that are lethal or rare diseases that cause significant morbidity. Those tests can allow people to know cancer risk or cardiac disease risk and make changes to their lifestyle or to their screening plans so that they can identify those diseases early and intervene before they show up late stage when there is no hope. And the sad thing is that we don't use that technology hardly at all in our system. Right. There, there are pockets, there are certain providers and, and certain types of clinics where those technologies do get used. But generally speaking, we don't use those. And it's an educational problem. It's a system infrastructure problem. And it's a it's a, a problem in terms of how that care is administered and supported. And it is really underscored by the point that there are only about 4,000 genetic counselors in the United States. That's a, uh, approximately oh, one genetic wow. counselor for every 90 or 100,000 people. Wow. So that capability, those are the people who understand this information and understand what to do with that information and understand how to communicate that information. And we just don't have enough of them. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough of them for every clinic in the United States or every hospital in the United States to be able to keep them on staff to support patients through uh, this type of journey. But it may be a supply and demand problem. If there was more of a demand, the supply would increase. Um, that, uh, if more people were uh, interested in genetic testing and the counseling, then more people would probably go into the Absolutely. field. Yeah, so I think that um, making people aware will benefit us all the way around. Absolutely. You know, um, yeah. Um, well, it seems that um, I'm thinking about how your office visit with the doctor and this, you can't remember how you got home. Uh, I can only imagine. And the difference the conversation might have been with a genetic counselor where uh, there, a life isn't at stake. Um, that would have been a much more different conversation, a more rational conversation, a conversation where you could make an appropriate decision and really take time to consider what your options are. Um, Absolutely. So I, I just think and it would be uh, a much better conversation, better conversation, and Absolutely. more supportive yeah. and. And I will say, looking back on our experience, one of, we obviously interacted with a lot of providers yeah. uh, at all different levels, physicians, nurses, um, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and on and on and on. And one of the most meaningful relationships that we had during during the process of Hobbes diagnosis and throughout her life and even after was with our genetic counselor, the genetic uh -huh. counselor that we got introduced to in the OBGYN clinic when we went in the day after Hobbes diagnosis for Myra to get her chorionic villus sampling. That woman whose name is Michelle was unbelievable in the way that she cared for us, in the way that she communicated with us, in the way that she helped to convey information and guide us through some very challenging and, and obviously well, how lucky you were to find her as a resource, even if it was not initially, which would have been incredibly helpful. At least it was close enough thereafter that it could really be a resource and assistance and provide the support you'd need to get through what you were dealing with. And is one of the reasons why I came to J Screen and immediately understood the. And we have to tell listeners that uh, we'll be speaking of J Screen further down the road, but J Screen is a wonderful um, group that does genetic and cancer screening for people around the country and around the world. Um, possibly. And um, it's just a really wonderful organization. And Matt 
has just agreed to be the new CEO of J Screen, and they are very lucky to have him. And he's lucky to be with J Screen because it it really provides a service that the rest of the country needs. Yeah, I couldn't say that better myself, Kathy. And I am so <laughs> lucky to to be able to join them and meet this amazing community that that uh, you know supports them, folks like you. So you have described, I'm thinking about how you and Myra got through this difficult time and you described a weekly celebration, which is a beautiful way to come together. I think that sometimes we hear about couples at time of uh, tragedy sometimes drift apart that the uh, the stress can be too much and they don't communicate and, and it can break up a loving family. It mm -hmm. seems as though you two have uh, bridged that. I wonder, can you share the secret? How did you do that? How did you support each other? Um, I mean, I, I feel so lucky to have met and married Myra. I, I think a lot of the credit goes to her uh and who knew i mean how could you know that something like this yes. was ahead um young couple yes young couple having their first child who knew and i i i just got lucky i guess in meeting oh. this amazing amazing human being um who has incredible strength and whose values are so in the right place all the time. Um, and, and I think a lot of it also goes uh, that there, a, a lot of credit needs to be given to our family. We were surrounded by and wrapped up by Myra's siblings, her brother, her sister, their significant others, my sister, um, her parents, my parents, and, and then a small circle beyond that who showed up in ways that I, I still have a hard time believing were real. Mm -hmm. um, and that level of community support around us and the way that they held Hav from the day of her diagnosis, literally through the morning she died, was mm -hmm. staining in a way that is hard to describe, but I think is the reason why I'm here, the reason why we're here and, and you know, still have a family together. Um, it is incredibly difficult and it hasn't been without its challenges, obviously, at various points. Um, well, what role did faith play, your faith play in helping you navigate both the difficult decisions and the emotions associated with everything, you've, all the challenges you were going through and the loss of your daughter. Yeah. That, that, that our relationship with faith was and has been challenging. Tay-Sex is a Jewish disease is how a lot of people know it. And And we obviously come from a deep Jewish tradition. On the one hand, we found tremendous support from that community and from the traditions of the Jewish faith. Shabbat birthdays were a great I was just of thinking that. of that. Yeah. yeah. It became such an incredible way to honor Hav and do something that was sacred every week with her and, and with our community. And in many ways that probably or potentially helped prepare us spiritually for the transition of her life and being open to being forced to exist with her in a different way since she's died. And I think Myra in particular, but, but both of us have it started to explore and, and become in, in much closer touch with 
a spiritual existence that is deeply rooted in in the Jewish tradition and and our Jewish identities and upbringings in a way that I don't think we would have had had we not gone through this experience. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Wow. Huh. Well, how did you interact with friends and family? You were talking about how they were always around you and surrounding you with love and support. And um, was there something in terms of advice for how family and friends should react to someone in such need of support? And, and you know, do you... Um, run the risk of ever overreaching. I mean, how do you walk the line and balance um, the your needs, both in expressing yourself as well as the family or friends need of uh, having some level of uh, space to really process what they're going through? Great, great questions. This, this actually is an area my wife has now devoted her life to it is trying to help people and families and communities learn how to show up for one another it, it is one of the hardest things yes yeah. which is which is in some ways is very odd it, it seems like a very basic thing to show up for others when they are struggling with something um, but but it is hard. It, it is profoundly difficult and complicated and all of the societal trappings of how we're supposed to interact and how we're supposed to feel get in the way of those things in, in many ways. Um, I think there and, and my wife has started an organization called Emotion that is explicitly trying to do this. It's a beautiful organization focused on um, ritual and movement and community in dealing with grief and trauma and loss. Um, oh, wow. And, many hard things. Uh, and she can speak to it much, much better than I can. But a few, like a few specific kernels from our experience is that I, I don't think there's ever an overreach when someone is going through a hard time the thing that you need the most is love and support. And that can be expressed and conveyed in a lot of different ways, but we were never, we would never turn away love and support. And we would never turn away in particular, someone showing love toward Hav. That, that was the most beautiful and powerful thing when someone would come into the house and scoop her up and give her a thousand kisses and sit with her in a chair for hours and not want to give her up. That, that was the, that was the best thing. Um, and I think there were also um, great meaningful, deeply impactful interactions from people who couldn't be here physically. And those kind of um, near, near but far type interactions, little text messages or someone ordering a coffee under Javi's name and mm -hmm. taking a photo of the order tag on the oh, coffee oh, and sending that. that. Now that I would never have thought of. Those are beautiful things. That is that, a beautiful absolutely thing. beautiful. And they they show they showed us that she was present in somebody's life that they were thinking about her. A day to day. I mean the, the, the most and this was dirt while while Javi was alive. This this both. were these yeah, were at this was both both while Javi was alive and and since then. And there is nothing that I love more than looking down at my phone and seeing a message from someone with a photo of L lavender was like Hobbes color and ha Hobbes flower. And, um, you know, somebody sending a photo of a beautiful landscape with purple flowers or oh. a coffee cup with her name on it, her name written in the sand on a beach with waves in the background. Those, oh. those types of things they are small things and they go so, so far. 
you know, you have really given us very concrete very concrete things that we can do. I think we've all been in a situation where we have a friend who uh, is grieving and we don't know how to support to them. Help. I, I, can, I can remember uh, there was a family at my child's school and their son swerved to miss, he was a driver, so he was 16. He swerved to miss a deer, ran in, he had a terrible car accident as a result. And I will tell you that when I would see the parents, I would well up and start crying mm. and somewhat run away from mm. them because I felt that I was bringing them more trauma. Mm. And I never knew how to support them. I think this is this is really um, this is something that's really important if you can <laughs> share uh, sharing these sorts of ways that we can show our compassion, show our support. Because you're exactly right. I've we've all had a lot of education, a lot of training, but we don't know how to do this. Yeah. How to support people when they're grieving? Um, yeah, it is and, hard, and we want to. We want to show that support. Totally. We don't know how. Yeah, totally. It, it is hard. It is very hard. It's it's hard for me now with other families who are going through unfortunately similar situations to ours. Yes to know uh -huh. what the right thing to do is, even though we had some of the best examples of that in our own experience. Um, so there is a sort of feeling your way along point, but I think in some ways, the things that we are afraid of are often the things that may mean the most to a family. Mm -hmm. Knowing that when, when someone, when I run into someone or I tell someone about Hav and they break down, and, you know, they cry. And if I'm with them, we embrace that. Um, That's amazing. That makes me feel like she has moved them, that she has impacted their life. I, I, I love that. That rawness, that fullness of emotion is powerful. It's be That's where I want to live. I want to live in that space. And um, when people run away, it makes you feel isolated. And it makes you feel like something's wrong. Like you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're an alien. And that, that doesn't, we feel That's like, not that, helpful. yeah, we feel like that anyway, losing a child it kind of pushes you outside of the, the normal, the normal world in many ways. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Now, are there any books that helped provide you with insight during this journey and how did they help you? Mm. Yeah, honestly, this is also probably one of the most transformative things that um, came about in our experience and um, continues is that shortly after Hobbes diagnosis, a family friend of Myra's gave us a book by a woman named Joanne Cacciatore called Bearing the Unbearable. And mm. she is a professor um, at the University of Arizona and um, a bereaved mother herself and a therapist who works in the space of uh, grief and loss, uh, especially for for um, for child, child loss. And that book was such a balm for us. It was such a clarifying, helpful place to be able to go uh, on a regular basis. We basically made it required reading for anyone who came into our circle, into our bubble. And we were very fortunate. We, we actually ended up getting connected to Dr. Joe and working with oh, wow. her. Before Hob died, we um, we would talk to her every other week um, for about an hour, and that was incredibly powerful work. And we still talk to her every few weeks now. Um, uh, she has a, a care farm out in outside of Sedona um, that her husband calls an amusement park for grief, but it, it's a it's just a beautiful spiritual place where having lost a child is, is something that everyone there has experienced. And, 
um, her model and her approach to this kind of tragic thing, I think is ultimately the way that we need to exist. And she and, and that book in particular, I, I think were transformative for us and, and life-saving in many ways. Oh, how beautiful. And if I can ask, you mentioned you have a daughter, Kaya, mm -hmm. and a son, Ezra. And um, I know that must give you such um, a force for continuing and, and living life to the fullest. But what steps did you take to prevent Tay-Sachs from reoccurring in your next pregnancies? And can you share more about this whole process? Yeah, of course. And and I think it is also the, our experience through that is is another reason why I came to JScreen and why I think what JScreen has done is so profound and important. Um, as I said, Myra was 11 weeks pregnant with Kaya, so we didn't have a, a real choice with her and obviously got lucky that she's just a carrier for Tay-Sachs, but we did have that choice with Ezra. And so we chose to pursue IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, and um, use a test called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic testing, where oh, wow. we test, we can test the embryo uh, and see whether that embryo is affected by, in our case, Tay-Sachs disease. And can then select the embryo or embryos that are not affected. And Ezra doesn't carry a mutation from me and he doesn't carry a mutation from Myra. Wow. So should he choose to have kids and have kids with someone who's not a carrier, that mutation is gone from his lineage. Tay-Sachs is gone from his lineage. That is so profound. I, I yeah. Have I think yeah. about it every single day that yeah. with a relatively simple technology and a relatively simple approach, we have potentially eliminated that disease from his lineage going forward. Um, and that's an amazing, amazing thing that we have wow. the ability to do. But Kaya will know when she gets older that she is a carrier and she will know to be tested. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So we've talked about J screen and uh, which is this genetic, wonderful, as Kathy described, wonderful genetic testing uh, and counseling service um, located at Emory University, um, which is in Atlanta. And thankfully, Matt, you agreed to become the CEO. I can't imagine a more perfect match and how wonderful for Jay Screen um, that uh, you'll be there to spread the word. Your passion is uh, obvious and um, they're lucky, certainly very lucky to have you. So, so uh, I wondered if you, you, I'm saying how wonderful it is. Can you talk about how you feel that your experience um, will impact your job and what you bring to the table for them? I think for a long time, I have always believed that medicine and research and making new medicines was my vocation. I felt drawn to the field of healthcare from a pretty young age and thought that it was a very powerful way to give back to society and and it is by all means it is now i am at this point where my personal life and my professional life have collided mm -hmm. and i cannot imagine any other purpose on this world than what i am doing right now and it has made me realize what vocation truly is uh, and not to discount how I felt before, but I think maybe, maybe there was always a little bit of a part of me that didn't quite believe or wasn't quite sure that that was what I was supposed to be doing. And, and now truly there, this is why I'm here. I, I feel like this is why I was put on this earth and what I am supposed to do. Um, 
And what a remarkable and lucky statement that you can make. I mean, it's just truly remarkable. Yeah, I feel really fortunate to have that, to be in that space and to have that opportunity. And it's a way for me to parent Hav. You mm-hmm. both have kids. You know that there is not a whole lot better than being able to be a parent to your children, to be able to talk about them and tell your friends about them and interact with them. And I, I don't get to do that for Hav in in the traditional way, in the normal way. And this is my way of doing that. I get to talk about her every day, every time I meet someone new. I get to tell Hobbs story and tell them about her. And that is an incredible gift. Um, and, and I will also say that I would for one minute with her, if I could have one more minute, I would, I would give it all back for Aww. one minute. Um, so, but yeah, I think to your question about why J screen and what, we want to accomplish in this next phase of its life. It is clear to me that preventive genetics and preventive genomics is something that should be universal. It should be something that everyone everywhere has access to because of what it can do to prevent disease. And Our goal is to figure out how to do that and to bring it to everyone everywhere in the U.S. and eventually internationally and to make it part of the way we live, part Mm -hmm. of the way we exist. It's so easy. It's a spit test. I mean, it's so easy. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's a spit test or a cheek swab that you can do in the comfort of your living room. Somehow we we have to get to couples um, and convince them to do this pre-genetic testing. Um, and especially uh, there are groups that seem to be predisposed to genetic uh, defects. Um, and it seems that Ashkenazi Jews are disproportionately affected. So Matt, we've had the privilege, Kathy and I, of interviewing uh, parents um, whose children have a range of of defects, such as Bloom syndrome, Wolfram, DF, um, that are genetic and seem to have a high proportion of Ashkenazi Jewish Uh, affect Ashkenazi Jewish people. And my hope is that you and Jay Scream can uh, reach that audience uh, and get them to update their testing, update their screening. Um, And I wonder if you have an idea of going into uh, temples or reaching out to rabbinical students in, in schools or where, where are you thinking, how are you going to reach this group that seems to be so highly, highly disproportionately affected? Hmm. Yeah, it's a very, very important question. And it's one of the challenges that we have ahead for us. And the answer is we're going to go everywhere. Uh, there, I, I don't think that there's a single channel that is the right one or the the magic way to reach people i think we need to explore all of them we need to explore jewish institutions like temples and synagogues and jccs and organizations like birthright and jewish day schools and we need to go beyond that i I think Compared to 30 or 40 years ago, the intermarriage rate is a lot higher than it used to yeah. be. And um, in in many beautiful ways, Jewish communities have become more and more integrated into the broader fabric of American society and, and global society. And some of those traditional, quote, Jewish channels may not be 
the best way to reach everyone. So we need to think about alternative strategies to find and connect with people who may not be going to those types of places anymore. Um, because even if they're even if they're marrying someone who is not of Jewish heritage, they should still get screened. Good there, point. There, are many, Good there point. are many cases. There are many cases, and I, I even have a a very good friend who is uh, of Ashkenazi Jewish descent himself and married someone who is not. And they just a few years before Hav gave birth to a daughter who had Tay-Sachs disease. Oh my goodness. Wow. And it turned out that in her background, there was Jewish. And in her background, unbeknownst to her, that there was a long history of children who had died of, neurodegenerative mm. disease that looked and actually was taste bites, but nobody in her heritage knew about that and mm. she wasn't he was screened he was screened and was was shown to be a, a carrier but because she was not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and didn't fall within the typical guidelines she was not screened no, tested and, oh my goodness oh, my that's goodness a, another example of it's such a simple thing to do yes. it's such a simple yes. test Matt, i think you should consider being in a documentary i think that uh, <laughs> you all should um your beautiful family i think that a documentary would be and maybe you can get someone in hbo to pick it up I'm not but kidding. i wait one sec i want to go back to what you're talking about testing and, and the family um where they had tay sex anyways um and your um family and i'm wondering once a couple has been tested um or you've been tested do you want to retest or do you wash your hands of it and say i'm all done yeah, I think where we are right now today, and this gets into a little bit of details of the testing, but right now the way testing is done is it's it's what they call panel-based testing. So they test right. for a certain number of genes that reflect a certain number of diseases. And that number has grown over time. You know, back in the 1970s, it was just Tay-Sachs. And for some period of time, it was six diseases and nine diseases and the number continues to grow because our knowledge of the relationship between genetics and disease get better and better with time as we learn more as we understand more and so those panels continue to grow um, and just as a personal example when Myra had the chorionic villus sampling, the CVS, and we tested Kaya, they ran a panel on her, on Kaya, of 250 diseases. And today, right now, JScreen is in the process of implementing a panel of 500 diseases. Wow. So in three years, we have seen a double in the number yes. of indications that can be tested for. And we're on the hyper exponential part of this curve. We are growing our knowledge of genetics so much and so quickly that the number of indications that we can test for is only going to grow. And that's true for carrier screening. It's also true for hereditary cancer screening, for hereditary cardiovascular disease screening, and, and more and more diseases and organ systems. We, we will be able to, to use this type of technology for lots of things in the future. And I think while in theory, you could ultimately do one test, sequence your genome and use that data over and over again to identify a uh, possible risk. And I think that's the hope of where we'll get in the future. But for now, staying on top of where testing is and what the status is and whether there are new panels, expanded panels that could be beneficial to you. That's something that we offer at JScreen. People call in all the time and say, hey, I was tested five years ago. Should I be retested? Or, you know, what's new? Should I, should I explore doing something else at this point in my life, given more family history or more personal experience? So the short answer is absolutely. I think my hope is we'll get to a point where everyone has their genome sequenced and wow. we can 
back and, and just interrogate that data set when we want more information or when appropriate. Wow. Well, to switch gears for one minute, I want to go to mental health is so very important, especially when you're going through medical challenges and difficult times. And I'm wondering, what's an activity that you do personally to reset yourself? Um, because you seem so together um, now, and I know now you've had uh, some, quite some time to process, but during uh, difficult times, what do you do? How do you reset yourself? Mm, it's a really, really good question. I I run a lot mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I run outside in nature. That nature has always been, the, the natural world has always been uh, a very restorative place for me. I think it's a very humbling place and obviously makes you feel part of something bigger. Um, it was also a place that we took Hav a lot. We explored the natural world in so many beautiful ways with her from the mountains to the ocean and everything in between. And it's a place where I can go now to be with her and to talk to her and to listen for her um, and feel her close by. And so that, that escape into the natural world, particularly on a long, quiet run is a tremendously restorative and rejuvenative um, space. And, and actually a lot of the work that Myra has done in exploring how to manage grief and trauma and loss um, has, has uncovered a lot of work, scientific work, and Dr. Joe's done a lot of this stuff as well, that there is real, there is something really powerful about movement and about repetitive movement in particular, running, walking, yoga. Um, and she says this much more articulately than I do, but when we're in the womb, we are, we are, um, we are constantly exposed to the rhythmic sounds of the mother, the heartbeat, the flow of blood, the movement through the day. And there is something uh, about movements like running or walking or yoga that recreate the same neurosensory pathway, re-stimulate the same neurosensory pathways that take us back to those very, very early days, those very, very formative days, um, and allow us to get into a bit of a different mind space. And I have found that profoundly in my own experience. Um, whenever I'm having a hard time, Myra will say, go out for a run, you know, get, oh. get out. <laughs> and a lot of times, and a lot of times we'll go together. And that's our a, a place and a way that we can process together as well. Matt, I want to thank you so much for being a guest today and for opening up about your family and your loss of your precious daughter, Javi. I also have to say, I am so proud that we could be a platform for you to advocate for genetic screening and genetic counseling, and in particular with JStream. We are big fans here at It Happened to Me. We uh, absolutely endorse what they're doing. And I'm so glad that uh, we can help you get the word out. This So young people out there, get screened before you start your family. Get screened wherever you want to. It's easy. Just a spit test or a swab, as the doctor has told us. Please follow his advice. And give us these beautiful children that Kathy and I want to nurture. <laughs> <laughs> we love all these babies, Kathy and I. Absolutely. And so, um, Doctor, again, I thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you. And for, sharing, thank you. sharing this wonderful, uh, sharing the news and sharing this information. And I know that our listeners have gotten a lot out of this episode today.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of It Happened to Me. We encourage you to learn more at ithappentomepod.com. Please use the contact form on our website to submit your guest suggestions, comments, questions, ideas, and feedback for the show. You can also email us directly at ithappentomepod at gmail.com. We would really appreciate it if you can leave us a five-star rating and review on your podcast app like Apple or Spotify. This helps others in the rare disease and medical challenge community find us. It Happened to Me is created and hosted by Kathy Gillenhorn and Beth Glassman. I'm Kira Deneen from DNA Today, and I serve as our executive producer and marketing lead. Amanda Andrioli is our associate producer. Ashlyn Anokian is our graphic designer. And remember, it happened to me. I'm not alone, and neither are you.